I'm going to invite you to take a seat, and while you're doing that, to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 is uh, the text we're launching from today. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you uh, and turn to page 2. <laughs> Literally, page 2. It's the, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. We're in chapter 2. It's page 2. should be easy to find uh, this time. And as always, if you need a Bible, you don't have one, you want to read God's Word, but you don't own a Bible, then take one of those with you. It is our gift to you because we want you to have the Bible, read the Bible, so that God can change your life through His Word. Uh, hey, here at Calvary, we want healthy families, and we want happy, thriving marriages, so we're willing to talk about the uncomfortable, the awkward, or even the taboo subjects. And today, we're continuing our series, Building a House of Faith. We've been looking at different rooms in the house, talking about how they relate to our lives and our relationships. And today, it's kind of obvious, we're talking about the bedroom. Not really sure what to say after that. So we'll just get on with the sermon. Uh, all right, so I got to ask a question. I've been I've been shocked by the answer, uh, honestly, at most of the services. But I just got to keep asking it and see. Uh, how many of you made your bed this morning before you came to church? Okay, a lot of hands still going up. Uh, maybe not highest percentage of some of the other services. I guess the OCD people come earlier. And uh, but <laughs> but how many of you would say that that right now, if right after the service I just went home with you, we we're gonna have lunch at your house, that that you know you could like give me a tour of your bedroom without having to go in there and clean up first. How many of you are that? You guys are guest ready. Wow, see, you people are OCD. Uh, and because uh, I confess, my, you know, my bedroom is not guest ready right now. I mean, when I left this morning, I did not make the bed. My wife was still in it. And uh, I didn't wake her either, so uh, I'm kind that way. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it, our room's a little bit messy. It's lived in. You know, take us a couple of minutes to straighten up if we're going to show you the the tour of the house and the truth is relationally our our bedrooms are messy uh the bed, bedroom may not be the source of our relationship problems but our relationship problems are manifest in the privacy of our bedrooms and so today we're talking about sex we're talking about intimacy we're talking about healthy marital relationships and i know this sermon will be a little bit messy a little bit awkward, maybe even a little bit uncomfortable, especially for me. Uh, but, but see, our goal is to bless your relationship through God's Word, to bless your marriage and your family through uh, applying God's Word. So uh, we're just going to tell you what it says. And the first thing we want you to know is that God created sex to bless us. God created sex to bless us. Genesis chapter 2 is, is part of the creation account. And if you're not familiar with Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis 1 is the big overview of creation. Here's how God did it, and he made everything, and it was good, and he keeps saying over and over again, it was good, it was good, it was good. And, and uh, Genesis chapter 2 is kind of a, a detailed creation of relationship. So uh, I want to look at, uh, toward the end of chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Uh, the very first time in the Bible that the words not good are used, it, it's before sin had invaded the world. It's before our rebellion, and it's in the context of loneliness. Skip down to verse 21. Here's what God did. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. God created sex to bless us. Uh, uh, in other words, we were designed by God from the very beginning to be sexual people. Uh, so this is not a taboo subject. This is a biblical subject. 
and, and uh, one that we ought to talk about, so we're talking about it. Because if you think about it, God could have created us to reproduce in different ways. He could have created us all different kinds of ways. He's God. But instead, he created us so that procreation is through sexual union between a man and a woman. And, and, uh, and, and since I'm kind of twisted and warped in my mind, I think, what are some of the other ways God could have actually made procreation happen? And one of the things that occurred to me was he could have done us like he did flowers with kind of some kind of hair pollination. Imagine if once a year all the men's hair just flew off their head. <laughs> It's a windy day, floated around, and whatever women's head it landed on, then she got pregnant. I, I mean, he does it with flowers. Why, did, why couldn't he do it with people? He could. You know, it would have totally changed the hat industry. <laughs> would no longer be about fashion, but it'd be in prophylactics, you know. <laughs> hey, that hairnet takes on a whole new meaning. It's not just about food anymore. So, and I don't know what my theory would say about bald guys, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, that, that's just where my mind goes. But see, God is, is good because God created sex to bless us. And so we need to understand that since sex is God's idea, we should follow God's plan. And God's plan is one man and one woman for one lifetime. That, that's his ideal. That's his plan. His desire to bless us and his design to bless us is one man, one woman, one lifetime. Now, because we fail at this, God redeems. I mean, practically every family in this room is, has been touched by divorce at some point or another. Maybe you personally, maybe uh, family members, friends, children, parents, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, you know, we, we fail because we're sinners. And yet God redeems. Some of us have failed because uh, our spouses were unfaithful, abusive, or they just abandoned us. But, but God redeems, and God gave us the ability to divorce and remarry as part of his redemption because he is a God of second chances. Now, yes, Scripture does say that God hates divorce. But God hates divorce because uh, his ideal plan to bless us has been shattered when a couple breaks up. See, God knew that there was going to be pain because nobody ever wants to go through a divorce. Divorce is a tragedy. Divorce is destructive, and it rips families apart. Not only does it do personal pain for the, the, the couple, but if there's children involved, it, it hurts them. And so when God looks at divorce, he grieves that it exists because he loves us, and he doesn't want us to experience that kind of pain at the, the most intimate unions in our life. But God gave divorce as a way to redeem. Divorce and remarriage. In fact, Jesus said, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses gave you a certificate of divorce. And, and so this is part of God's plan of second chances. So understand that God's plan A, what he wants for all of us, is one man, one woman for one lifetime. God's plan B is, because of divorce, remarriage. One man, one woman for the rest of your lives. There is no biblical plan C. Can, can I just be really clear about that? There's no biblical provision for a union to be blessed by God other than a monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. Which means there's no biblical provision for, for gay marriage. There's no biblical provision for polyamorous relationships, which is the next trend that's coming. Uh, and, and understand that while you know, those marriages may be legal and society may embrace them, as those of us who follow Jesus, we can't bless them. Hey, look, we're commanded by God to love. We're going to love people, period. You know, we're just going to love people. We're going to go ahead and share the, the grace of Jesus and the kindness of Jesus to them. But when you talk about stepping into a place of blessing, we are limited by what God blesses in his word. And since here at Calvary, we believe this book is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. This is our guideline for blessing. So God's plan, God's idea is one man, one woman for one lifetime. Why did he have that plan? Because intimacy grows out of a loving, faithful, committed relationship. Intimacy is going to grow out of a loving, faithful, committed relationship. Over the years, a biblical marriage is going to produce security. It's going to produce closeness. It's going to create oneness. The two are going to become one physically, obviously, but emotionally, socially, relationally, spiritually. 
that oneness is going to happen with the couple as they love each other in God's plan. And see, the idea is for spouses to bless one another by giving themselves only to the other. Now, this requires trust and vulnerability. But if we'll take that chance, it will produce trust and intimacy in our relationships. So God's plan was to create sex in order to bless us. But Satan corrupts sex to destroy us. See, Satan is the adversary. He's the deceiver. He's the liar. And, and if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then Satan is opposed to you. He wants to destroy you. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 10. He said, the thief, talking about Satan, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That your life would be overflowing, joy-filled. And, and so what God creates, Satan tries to corrupt. So Satan takes the gifts of God, like sex, and corrupts them and perverts them and twists them and then deceives us with them to accomplish his goal of destroying the people that God loves. Uh, and, and if you're paying attention, then you probably are aware that our pornography-driven, sex-saturated, tender, happy world is killing us. And it's killing us literally. Let me, let me just share with you three ways that Satan has corrupted God's gift that causes us damage in our homes and our relationships. First of all, pornography is killing our libido, our sex drive. Uh, look, if you're alive, you know pornography is everywhere. Our culture is saturated in it. It's having a uh, scary impact. But here's a couple of facts you may not know. For every $1 spent in the United States on Major League Sports, we're talking about National Football League, uh, Major League Baseball, National Basketball Association, which is kind of big money, billions. For every $1 spent on Major League Sports in America, $3 is spent on pornography. Yeah, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Because, I mean, we make sports like an idol uh, unbelievably, and yet we spend three times as much on pornography. Uh, this is scary. The average first encounter with pornography for children now is under the age of 11. Hardcore pornography, 11 years old. Uh, and, and so let me just rant for a minute. Parents, please don't give your young children unfiltered, unrestricted access to the internet on devices, phones and tablets. Please don't do that. I, I, I'm pretty sure there's not a parent in here that would give your 10-year-old a loaded gun and say, hey, play safely with it. You wouldn't do that. I mean, you might teach them to shoot, but you're going to be there, you're going to be supervising, you're going to be watching, but, but you're not going to just say, hey, play, don't hurt yourself or your, ki or your friends. You're not going to give your 9-year-old a bottle of poison and say, be careful. You're not going to, to say to your 8-year-old, hey, here's all these big explosive fireworks I bought for the 4th of July that are left over. Here, here's some matches. Why don't you go have some fun? Just don't hurt yourself. See, you're not going to do that. None of us would do that. You go, that's crazy. And yet, giving our children unfiltered, unsupervised access to the Internet is opening up their minds and their hearts, their souls, for destruction, for poison, for damage that's going to last a lifetime. Parents, maybe you haven't thought about this, but they're growing up in a world that is different than the world we grew up in. So protect your children because pornography is killing us. And, and let me just share with you the impact of pornography on people because they're just now starting to measure this. Uh, I got some information from the National Institute of Health, and so you know that it's not religiously biased at all. And, uh, and they did a comparison study of prior to widespread access to the Internet, like back in the 1990s, and versus like 2010 when everybody's got access to the internet everywhere on every device that we own. And here's what they found. This is just one thing that they found. This is crazy uh, in its destructive impact. So in the, in the 90s, erectile dysfunction among men under the age of 40 was about 2%. 2%. Do you know what it is now? And, and different studies have been done. And they, they found that under the age of 40, men under the age of 40 now have erectile dysfunction at a rate between 20 and 30%. 20 to 30 percent. The reason is pornography. It's everywhere. And it's killing us. And, and I just want to say, if you're struggling with pornography and you want help, 
Jesus can change your life. He can cleanse your mind. He can give you a fresh start. Whether you're a man or a woman, if this is something that you're battling, you're, you're fighting, and by the way, statistics say that about half the people in church are fighting it, then we get that. We understand that. And, and change begins when you admit that you've got an issue, and you, you break the secrecy, you break the darkness, the hold on your life, and you come into the light and you admit it. And after the service, we're going to have pastors here at the front. We've got our prayer team here at the front and, and people who are available to talk with you who understand the battle and are willing to, to discuss it with you, pray with you. We've got a, our men's ministry pastor, Howard Cooper. He will be here at the front uh, after the service. His testimony is one that God delivered him after decades of porn addiction that destroyed a marriage. Look, we understand the battle. That's why you've got resources in your bulletin. Uh, a place that, if you fight this at all, triplexchurch.com. I know it sounds crazy, doesn't it? But the website is xxxchurch.com. And, and this ministry exists to help people with sex addiction and porn addiction. And they've got accountability and they've got Bible studies and they've got uh, people, resources that will help you. There's a book every couple ought to read called Every Man's Battle that frames the discussion. Just understand that Pornography is killing our libido. Don't let porn kill your relationship. Don't let it happen. Another way that Satan is killing us is that STDs are killing our bodies. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control considers STDs to be epidemic in America today. They say that 40% of Americans have or have had a sexually transmitted disease. And some of you germaphobes just had chills run down your spine because you're like, the people sitting next to me? You see, it's epidemic. Its fastest growing group for STDs is 15 to 24-year-olds. Kids that don't know uh, about all this. Damaging effects, just real quickly, I mentioned 20,000 women a year become infertile because of STDs. And drug-resistant, sexually transmitted diseases are growing and spreading at a rapid rate. They will soon be epidemic, and that means that you can't get cured from it anymore. So STDs are killing our bodies. Hookup culture is killing relationships. Uh, we all know that smartphones are damaging conversation, right? Just the ability for us to look each other in the eye and have conversation. But uh, our tender culture has reduced courtship and romance and relationship skills to swipe right. And Satan is selling it as fun, as exciting, as freedom, until we realize that sexual freedom becomes addiction, disease, and loneliness. And we've taken God's wonderful gift, and we've turned it into recreational encounters that destroy the majesty and beauty of what God wants to bless us with. So God created sex to bless us. Satan corrupts sex to destroy us. And the truth is, most of us in this room want to live in God's blessings. Most of us in this room want to honor God in our marriages. We want to have healthy families and healthy homes for our kids to grow up in. And, and, and yet, we've been corrupted, we've been deceived, we've been abused. So, let me just say this, that, that I hope applies to every person in this room. God's grace abounds to us. No matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, how you've failed... Whatever shame you're carrying, whatever guilt you've got hidden deep down in the recesses of your heart, God's grace abounds to you. 1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to purify us of all unrighteousness. His grace abounds to you. Get, look, God is not looking at you with disgust or thinking you're a failure or I can't believe you did that. What God is looking at you is with compassion saying, look, my child, if you'll come to me and you'll just simply acknowledge how you failed, I will forgive you. I will cleanse you. I will give you a fresh start. That's what grace is all about. It just begins when we ask God for help and we listen to his wisdom. So God wants to bless us. Let's talk about building healthy intimacy. Building healthy intimacy. I want to share some, very briefly, principles from Scripture and counselors that I talked to in, in, in getting this message ready. I just asked the counselors, uh, hey, how would you build, how, do you, how would you tell couples to build intimacy? And, and then I kind of took what they shared and what Scripture says and put it together. And, uh, and I'd encourage you to go back and read these Scriptures and pray with your spouse. If you need to get counsel, get counseling, whether that's professional or pastoral or talking to some friends that... 
that uh, uh, you know, really, you really respect their marriage. But these are four steps to building intimacy. These steps are really simple, but not easy. It is not easy because we're all in these patterns in our relationships. And these patterns become ruts. And these ruts become uh, prisons for us. And we don't want to break the patterns, even if that we hate the patterns that we're in. And the hardest thing to do is to change those relationship patterns in your marriage. But God will help you to do that if you will go ahead and take those steps and get the help and apply yourself. So here's some four, four steps to building intimacy that I'm going to share with you today. First of all, decide to delight. Decide to delight. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Solomon was, was the wisest guy ever to live and, and he wrote these words in the context of don't be stupid and mess around and chase after the adulteress, but rejoice instead in the wife of your youth. How you look at your spouse makes all the difference in your relationship. The attitude that you approach your spouse with it is huge. It, it's transformative. And so, uh, you know, if you look at your spouse and all you see is their flaws and, and the way they frustrate you, the way they disappoint you, uh, you're never going to be happy in your marriage and you're, it's going to be sick. But if you can look at your, your spouse and be grateful that God gave him or her to you, if you can affirm your spouse's strengths and the way that they bless you, that's delighting in your spouse and then your marriage will blossom. Intimacy will grow. Uh, if you focus on how you can prove, improve as a partner instead of how they need to improve, you'll be a lot happier. Can I, can I just tell you that? See, our, our problem is in this thing uh, called expectations. And delighting in your spouse means that you choose to love them for who they are, not who you wish they were. You see, because we, we, we come into relationships with all these expectations, and most of the time, we don't ever actually ever say what the expectations are. We just got all these ideas about what marriage is supposed to be like and who, what you're supposed to be like. And, and, uh, and then when you don't live up to our expectations, we get upset and angry and you've got problems and you need to change. I know because it happened in my life. My wife and I, we dated for four years before we got married. We knew each other really well. And, and a month after our, our wedding, uh, I was praying to God saying, God, what have I done? <laughs> this is not as much fun as I thought it would be. And uh, the problem was it was all about me and what I wanted from her and I was looking at her and seeing her flaws rather than seeing the flaws in me as a husband because I wasn't loving her the way that God created me to love her and I needed to repent and I needed to work on me and being the husband that God created me to be and and, and love her love Morelda as she is not as I wish she was decide to delight in your spouse that's where this begins and then communicate gently. Communicate gently. Ephesians 4.29, the Apostle Paul says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that, that it may give grace to those who hear. That don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Give grace to those who listen to you. So communicate with your spouse. Share the details of life, the day-to-day -day stuff. Share how you feel, your hopes, your dreams, your frustrations, your failures. In other words, talk together. I know some of you guys just groaned right now. He's always wanting me to talk. Do I have to talk? Yes, if you want to have a healthy relationship, you got to talk. Maybe not, you know, all the time, because I know my wife sometimes wishes I would shut up. But, uh, but you got to communicate. And you have to communicate in a way that builds up the other because so many times we communicate negatively. We point out all the things they do wrong, not affirm the things they do right. We tear them down to make ourselves feel better, and that's opposite of God's way. God's way is building them up, affirming their strengths, telling them how they bless you, celebrating the good things, encouraging. And as you do that, as, as your grace pours out on them through your speech, it's going to build a relationship. So communicate gently and communicate often because that builds trust. Now I'm going to confess something at, at this point that uh, I'm guessing some others struggle with. I, I really like taking Merelda out for lunch or dinner. And it has nothing to do with the, uh, her cooking skills because she's a great cook. It has everything to do with self-control. 
Because when we go out to lunch or dinner, it's a technology-free conversation. We're, we're not in our phones. We're not on our tablets. We're not paying attention to the TV. Uh, we're talking to each other. We're making eye contact with each other. And the distractions are removed. And so I confess that's one of the ploys I have. I was like, we need to go out to, to dinner because we need to talk. And at home, the TV's a distraction, the tablet's too convenient, uh, the meal doesn't last nearly as long, and, and so if that's what you need to do, do that. But create those technology-free moments where you can focus on your spouse and talk together, communicate gently. And then if you want to have a, a strong and healthy marriage, then forgive daily. Forgive daily. Uh, Ephesians 4.32 be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Can I just be honest? Anger and resentment destroy intimacy. If you are angry at someone, you cannot joyfully give yourself to them. It, it just kind of doesn't fit. And, and, and so anger and resentment destroy intimacy, and yet we all know how easy it is to get angry at your spouse, right? Because if you're married any length of time at all, you understand what makes them mad, and you can push their button really easy. I mean, that's the true easy button. You know, Staples doesn't have it. It's your spouse, and you know right where it is, and you can just go, I don't want to talk. I'll make them mad. I don't want to be intimate. I can start a fight right now. And, and so anger and resentment, they're, they're part of that, that marriage relationship. We understand that, and forgiveness empties the anger bucket. See, emotionally, every one of us is carrying around an anger bucket. Yours may be small, it may be big, doesn't matter. Uh, every time you get angry, you pour your emotions into that bucket, and what happens is if you don't empty it, then it starts at some point to fill up and it spills out on the people around you. And they may be the people that don't deserve your anger. Forgiveness empties that bucket. So you need to forgive people at work, you need to forgive people in traffic, you need to forgive people wherever you go. You especially need to forgive your spouse because if you're angry, you won't enjoy your spouse. Forgiveness allows you to celebrate life and enjoy life with your spouse. And, and I know that some of you have been hurt deeply, especially by loved ones. And, and forgiveness isn't easy, it isn't quick, it isn't simple. It's a process that may require help. You may need to talk to a pastor. You may need to go see a counselor. You may need to go to celebrate recovery. Uh, but if you want a healthy, intimate relationship, forgiveness is essential. So decide to delight, communicate gently, forgive daily, touch often. Touch often. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church. That means he's writing to people like us. And he says this, beginning at verse 2. I really like this passage. You'll see why in just a second. Beginning at verse 2. The apostle says, But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Just pause there and praise God for his goodness. See, some of you think the Bible is boring. The Bible just said that we're supposed to have sex. I like the Bible. <laughs> Verse 4, For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. I'm going to pause because some of you just heard half that verse. <laughs> and I don't want you to go home and take Scripture out of context because some of you guys are going, it says that? You're going to go home and you go, Honey, your body wants to have sex. Second half of the verse, she's going to answer and say, yours doesn't. <laughs> Just want you to be in context here. There, there's got to be mutuality here. Verse 5, do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Let me just be really obvious. You can't be physically intimate without touching. And, and the Apostle Paul warns about the dangers for couples of denying sexual contact with your spouse. And so a healthy marriage involves mutually satisfying sex life and it involves plenty of non-sexual touching as well. That means, for those of you who don't understand, hugging, cuddling, hand-holding. In my household, it means foot rubbing. Uh, it's not either or, it's both and. 
sexual and non-sexual touch, uh, if either one is missing, then your relationship's not healthy. So couples, talk about it. Dare to ask one another. Engage in that conversation gently and with grace. You know, uh, ask the question, are you satisfied with our sex life? And listen to one another. Ask your, each other, do we touch enough outside of sex? Because if the only time you have physical contact is, is when you're engaged in an intimate relationship, then you're, you're missing out on something. And, and hear each other and learn from each other and discuss this so that you are mutually together in, in what your life is going to look like. Because then you'll grow in trust, and as you grow in trust, you'll grow in intimacy. After all, God created sex and marriage to bless us. And his gifts are good, and we ought to praise him for that. I, I want to close today uh, differently than we normally close. Um, in just a moment, I want to pray for couples. I want to pray for everybody, but I especially want to pray for couples. And, and, and what I'm going to ask is if, if you're here and you're a couple, and you really want God to, to be you know, honored in your relationship— you want a healthier relationship, you want a stronger relationship, you want one that, that uh, just glorifies Christ in every piece of it, then what I'm going to do is, is just ask the men to reach over and grab your wife's hand and just get up from where you're seated and awkwardly come up here to the front so I can pray for you. Uh, and, and that begins now. And see, some of you are like, uh, well, that's awkward. Yeah, but it says the whole sermon's been awkward, so just go ahead. You're not saying that your marriage is struggling. You're not saying your marriage is perfect. You're just saying you want Jesus to be more a part of your relationship than he has been. And, and if your spouse isn't here or if you're single or widowed or whatever, then just give us some grace and some time to, uh, to do this because we want healthy families and healthy homes. You may not all be able to get up to the front, and if that's the case, praise God. We got more couples than that than we can fit. But I just want you guys to invite Jesus to be involved in your marriage and in your relationship because he wants to heal us, he wants to help us, he wants to grow us. And if you need to talk with someone beyond this sermon, you want to talk to a pastor afterwards, uh, members of our prayer team are going to be up front afterwards, pastors are going to be here to talk uh, and pray with you because we want to see God redeem our relationships. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift of marriage. Thank you for the way that you bless us and have created us. And God, we confess that we need you. We need you in our homes to heal us, to teach us, to grow us, to, to help us to forgive one another, to help us to delight in one another, to help us to communicate with grace with each other. Father, we need you to teach us how to love like you love us. And so right now, I pray for the couples that are filling the front of this room. I praise you for them. I thank you for their commitment to you and to each other. And God, I pray that you would bring healing where there is brokenness. I pray that you would redeem what uh, Satan has trashed. I pray that you would restore and strengthen families that have been struggling. God, fill us with love for you and for each other and just show up in our homes and in our marriages in a powerful way so that we can be families that glorify Jesus Christ and demonstrate what it is to live as a godly family. Father, I pray for those that, uh, that are not standing here at the front. I pray for those that are single, those that are, are, are attending alone, for those that are widowed uh, or, or just broken by divorce. God, that you'd meet them and fill them with love and grace and hope as well today. Because as a church, we want to represent the goodness and the power and the love of Jesus to a world that is desperate to know it. God, thank you for loving us. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.